Let me read you Matthew chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus came to them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came to the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appeared to appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, and yet some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we've been doing as we've been going through the confessions and creeds of the church, we started with the simplest and earliest confession, one that we still use today. In fact, at our celebration of Resurrection Sunday, it is common to say during the course of the service, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And that was the first of the great confessions. This declaration, this affirmation that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so that was the first one. Then <clears throat> we talked about next about how the Christians quickly came into conflict with the Roman culture and the Roman cult. Now, culture, you know, can either refer to a, a pot of yogurt or it can refer to the mess of what people do with their lives all together. And so we have a certain culture that we belong to. Um, there's actually something very similar between culture of society and culture of yogurt, I think. But that's not a theological statement. So, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And then as they started, cultures and cult started to bang up against each other, the simple phrase, Jesus is Lord, was dramatic and powerful because the confession that was expected of everyone who was a under the authority of Rome was to say, Caesar is Lord. In fact, when they would convene festivals to celebrate the emperor, you were supposed to go to the temple, the lo- whatever uh, was the biggest temple in the town, and go and put a pinch of 
incense onto the incense altar and say, Caesar is Lord. And there were times where the, the Christians would refuse to do that, and if they would refuse to do that, they would be arrested. Um, there are stories of their neighbors actually holding their hands to their side and, and sticking their arms out and burning incense for them because they didn't want them arrested. Um, somebody made the statement, I guess it was Don, who said nobody wants to be martyred. Uh, nobody wants to become a martyr. But there was one man we talked about briefly, Justin, who it was known as Justin the Martyr, but it took him his entire life to get to be a martyr. And he would go to where the, there were people confronting the Christians and, and be very explicit about his faith. And God let him uh, last for almost 60 years that way. But now we're coming to a point in history where Christianity is more than tolerated. Christianity is accepted. We're coming into the fourth century, which, by the way, that last hymn we sang is a fourth century hymn. And you notice how Trinitarian that hymn is. And it's, that's because that was the, the mindset of the time, because this is when Christians were starting to, to bump up against people who call themselves Christians, but had a very different view of Jesus and who he was. And so the, what we're going to be looking at today is the Nicene Creed. And um, we say the Nicene Creed probably four or five times a year here. Um, I think it's appropriate that as we put Thanksgiving behind us, and we're looking ahead to Christmas, that we should be thinking about the Nicene Creed, because St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, had an important part at the Council of Nicaea. And that's how we got our Nicene Creed. It was the result of that council meeting together to decide what do, does the church universally believe about Jesus? And so the Nicene Creed is a statement of faith. And surprisingly, the Nicene Creed is the only ecumenical statement of faith. It is the only statement of faith that is used by every single branch of Christianity, or at least um, Trinitarian Christianity. Uh, there, are, there are branches of Christianity that don't, well, Coptic and some of the, in Africa there's the Coptic and the, this uh, Amharic traditions that are a little different. But for us, let's just leave it at that, that the Trinitarian viewpoint was really taking hold. And so, as others were standing up and saying, no, Jesus was not eternal. Jesus wasn't God, and other things like that. They came together, and at this, this conference, we'll call it, because... We don't often talk about councils, but we, go, we all know what a conference is. They're at this conference, this, this meeting, and there was one person there who was arguing passionately for the fact that Jesus was just the first creature. But he was a creature, that he was made, that he was not eternal, that he had a beginning. And this is a man named Arius, and he was very passionate. And there were many people who were trying, were being persuaded to follow him. And then one bishop from the city of Myra in Turkey stood up and got so exercised at what he was saying that he walked up to him and he smacked him across the side of the face. And uh, that was St. Nicholas. He wasn't a saint then, they just called him Nicholas. But there he was. He was taken, bound to prison, 
locked up overnight, and they took away from him the, uh, the garment that only bishops wear in the ancient church. And it, was, it was kind of like a, a white stole that went around and had, usually had crosses embroidered on it. And they took that away, and they took his Bible away. And uh, actually, they took, it was a book of the four Gospels. They took his Gospel book away, and um, they put him in jail overnight. So, there he was, Santa Claus, which St. Nicholas, Santa Claus is short for St. Nicholas. There he was, Nicholas, locked up in jail. And so, everybody was shocked. It was unbelievable that a bishop would do this, that he would get up and that he would strike another person in the meeting. And so they, they took him, and Constantine, the emperor, told him to be locked up overnight. So they stripped him of his bishop's garments, they chained him, they threw him into jail, and they thought that that would keep Nicholas away from the meeting. And then the, when the meeting was over, they would make a decision about what they would do with Nicholas. Nicholas was a little ashamed, and he prayed all night for forgiveness, though he never did change his attitude about what he believed, just his attitude about Arius. And during the night, in a vision, Jesus and his mother appeared saying, why are you in jail? And the tradition says that because of my love for you, he answered. They then gave him back the book of Gospels and his stole that he put on. And so he was, when they came to find him in the morning, he was no longer bound in chains and he was there with his Bishop Stoll and his gospel books in hand, and uh, everybody was amazed. And he was sitting there quietly reading the scriptures, waiting for them to come. When Constantine heard this, the emperor was amazed and, and frightened, and he commanded Nicholas to be let go, and would be fully in, reinstated as the bishop. In the end, the council agreed with Nicholas against Arius. The question of who Jesus was was decided that day and for the next 16, 1700 years, everywhere, Christians from, from the, all the four major Protestant, well not Protestant, the four major divisions in Asia Minor and Europe, Rome, Greece, Turkey, all of them, the, the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, and the Anglican Church all use the Nicene Creed. And so we want to take some time and look at the Nicene Creed. And, but it's good to know how we got here. And, and you can see that so many of these different steps that the church takes to articulate carefully what it believes comes out of some kind of confrontation to make it plain and simple so that people can say, yes, this is what I believe. And so the, the Nicene Creed is structured on three simple affirmations. They each a firm belief in one of the persons of the Trinity. The first one is the simplest and the shortest. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. You can see nobody would disagree with that. Even Arius would have agreed with that. But then I believe and in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, here, listen to what they affirm about Jesus Christ. I believe 
in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. This is the longest section of the Creed. In this section where it says, I believe in Jesus Christ, it confesses faith both in the divine character of Christ, but also it enumerates the major points of his earthly ministry, especially his death and his resurrection. This is where the historic occasion of the Creed becomes very obvious. In the nature of the Christ that occasioned the council and now that colors the creed they crafted and bequeathed to all of us who have come after them. They were affirming that Jesus was born and that he lived, that he preached, that he was crucified, he suffered, he was resurrected. And so unlike and then the final section, the third affirmation, talks about the Holy Spirit. In it, they affirm that their faith in the Holy Spirit as divine and equal with the Father and the Son. And then they go on, the creed goes on to affirm belief in the unity of the church and in the expectation of the resurrection and the glorifier, the glorification of believers. Unlike the Apostles' Creed, which is hard to date because it was not the product of any one body, but was gradually used to express the faith of the church, this statement was published, was verified by the emperor, it was commanded, commended, not commanded, commended to all the churches, the Nicene Creed is born out of controversy, becomes the pattern of faith that will speak to every branch of the church in the years ahead, and it still is used today to affirm what believers everywhere hold to be true. It's important to remember all the basic tenets of faith that our voice in the creed have been affirmed in earlier statements. The creed did not make up the Christian faith. There are those who would say that, oh, you know, the church didn't believe these things until the fourth century. And they would point to the Nicene Creed and say, see, that's when the church decided what to believe. And that's not the case at all because it comes out of the church looking at what everybody believed and saying, no, we have to articulate what is universal between us. And so the creed is a testimony not to what the church decided to believe, but what the church affirmed that they have always believed. And so they did not make up the Christian faith, but it gave voice to the heart of the church. And the creed was a product of the desire to be explicit about what was judged the historic teaching and the uh, the both of Jesus and the apostles. So I'm going to do something right now so that we can really get this. And I won't make you stand, but I would like you to turn to the, I think it's page 716. Seven seventeen. And let us use this ancient creed to express our faith tonight. What do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, 
begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So there you see, everything that is important to believe is, is very succinctly expressed there. It talks about Jesus. Who is Jesus? If you listen to the words of the creed, did the church have any doubt that Jesus was God? Absolutely not. Very God of very God. Begotten, not made. One substance with the Father. So, first thing that they, first controversy that they wanted to be, come down strong on was the deity of Christ. But was he really man? Could he really save us? Well, for us men and our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. He was made man. And he doubts there, no, he was truly a human being, crucified suffered and buried, and the third day he rose again. And all in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and so on. The genius of this is that it takes the entire scriptures and, and places them into such a, a, a clear and simple statement about where Jesus stands in the plan of redemption and how central he is to everything that God is doing. And so with this creed, the, the Council of Nicaea did not end the controversy. It would take most of the rest of the fourth century for the creed to travel and, and have its impact. But there are today people who still believe and still teach that Jesus wasn't, man, wasn't God or that Jesus wasn't fully man. And so of, I think of all the creeds that, that is most important to, to continue to use the Nicene Creed really does keep us moored. Is that a great, good way to put it? Um, has anybody ever been in a boat in a storm that was anchored? It's not very pleasant. And uh, a lot of times the boats won't even try to weather a storm that way. They'll let the winds blow them where they will because the strain on the boat keeping its place is tough. It's hard. And yet we are moored. We are not like a boat that's on the waves being blown about by every change in the wind of man's opinions and, you know, science and whatever else people want to bring against what we believe. But we are moored. We are tied to the Word of God. And one of those things that ties us firmly to the Word of God are things like the confessions that we have been studying, but especially this Nicene Confession, because it, it so clearly 
delineates the strands of that cable that hold us anchored to the truth. And so one of the great advantages that we have in these creeds, and especially in the Nicene Creed, is a simple, concise, yet full declaration of who we believe Jesus is, who the scripture teaches Jesus is. And um, people say, do you really believe? And they bring out something outlandish and say, no, you know, if you want to know what we believe, here. And uh, so one of the great, I think, and I do believe that it was used not just to defend the faith, but evangelistically through that period when, you know, the church was coming up against the culture in such a dramatic and powerful way. And the church grew. And uh, I think that the creed had a part in that as well. So, um, almost feel like we should sing a song, but we're not going <laughs> to. Um, with that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. If he had not come, if he had not taken a genuine human form, if he had not suffered bearing our sins on the tree, we would be hopeless and lost today. But he did come. He came through the influence of the Holy Spirit, conceived in a virgin, born of Mary. He lived a sinless and perfect life for us. He died in agony, in great distress for our punishment. He was buried, and our guilt was buried with him. We bear it no more. Father, we thank you that in him we have life, and as he was raised from the dead, that same spirit that raised him up can make us alive so that that past of sin now is effaced and, and wiped away as we grow more like Jesus and walk in obedience and holiness. Father, we look forward to that day when the process will be over. What was begun on the cross will be completed when we see our Savior on the throne, the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. We look forward to that day. But as we live here, we thank you that we have statements like these that we have been studying and now this Nicene Creed to keep us anchored and moored to the truth. Lord, when the winds blow we thank you that our cable holds and that we are connected to the truth. And Father, we pray that we would stand. And when we've done everything to stand, by your grace, Lord, we're going to stand. So we pray, be with us. Especially now as we prepare to go home, we ask that you would watch over us in the slick roads and the difficult vision. Father, keep us safe as we go our way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.